Our next speaker is the founder of the Alabama Cannabis Coalition. Um, I know Marty Shelper pretty well, and she always is keeping me up to date on the craziness that's happening with the, uh, the Marijuana Cannabis uh, Commission. <laughs> so please welcome up Ms. Marty Shelper. I'm honored to be here today, just to be in a room with libertarians that believe in freedom and liberty. Do I need to move this down? But following John Sophocles is a place for some bigger shoes to fill. I love you, Soph. We don't want to hide your face, Mark. <laughs> Thank you. So, as I said before, it's great being in a room with fellow libertarians, people who love freedom and liberty and are willing to take time out of their busy schedules and their lives to fight for something. And it's so hard to get people involved in their community, within politics, because people are so apathetic, because they think that their vote doesn't matter. They think that contacting their legislators doesn't matter, and that is the farthest thing from the truth, because there's two things that legislators listen to. Legislators listen to the constituents, the voters, and they listen to lobbyists. Those two things right there are what legislators listen to. And when you take those voters and those constituents away, the only thing that's controlling those legislators are the lobbyists and the money that those lobbyists have to promote what those lobbyists want to see happen in the state of Alabama. So as citizens, as voters, we do not get involved with our legislators and let them know by calling them, by emailing them, by going to meetings when they hold rallies to let them know what our hopes and what our beliefs are for the state of Alabama. They're going to be controlled by those lobbyists. So apathy is what is killing the liberty movement. So, you know, to grow the liberty movement, we need to bring more like-minded people in and we need to be active ourselves. But today, I wanted to tell you why I am an accidental lobbyist. My sister died of chemotherapy poisoning on August the 17th of 2012. And I have been a cannabis consumer for 48 years. Today, 48 years. So I take 12 years away from that. But um, when she passed away, I had just begun to realize the medicinal qualities of the, the plant cannabis. I had always been a recreational user, felt like that I should have the freedom and the liberty to consume and to put into my body anything that I wanted to put into my body. But as soon as my sister died on the 17th, on August the 18th, my cannabis advocacy was born in earnest. I have been relentless for 11 and a half years. I'm going into my 12th year this year. And um, the most difficult thing that I've had to face is the apathy. I was talking to Dr. Blake a little while ago outside and we were talking about uh, getting people involved, people that are passionate, people want to go on social media, it's an echo chamber. You know, they think because they're complaining about something on social media that somehow miraculously the governor, the attorney general, their legislators know that that's, you know, what these people are complaining about. And, and, and those people, you know, we might have some snoops that are following the Alabama Cannabis Coalition on Facebook or TikTok or Twitter, you know, but it's probably an accident that they see anything that's going on there. So that's not where that's not where the rubber meets the road. The rubber meets the road when you call them, when you pin them down, when you email them to let them know, you know, what's going on. So that's how my accidental lobbyist, how I became an accidental lobbyist. And the difference between me and most lobbyists are lobbyists are paid. They're paid for a political agenda by a corporation, typically, to get whatever that corporation needs through to their legislators in a particular district. As far as me becoming a lobbyist, because I was a little bit hesitant, because there are negative connotations to what a lobbyist is. You know, when you tell somebody you're a lobbyist, they're like, oh, well, who's paying you and what are you fighting for? I'm, I was fighting for the citizens of the state of Alabama. I was fighting for the freedom and the liberty of the citizens of Alabama 
to have legal access to cannabis. And when I first started my cannabis advocacy, I was fighting to end the insanity, to end cannabis prohibition. You know, I mean, I was going full Monty. Well, then I realized after talking to some other cannabis advocates, and I still don't support this cause, but this is where cannabis advocacy went. Oh, we've got to get medical cannabis in the state of Alabama before we could even talk about decriminalization, before we could even talk about legalization. And I want to say legalization in quotation marks because legalization is not the answer. Cannabis needs to be removed from the Controlled Substance Act, and it was put there in 1970 by Richard Nixon. And in 1937 is when cannabis was prohibited by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So people think that cannabis is a, uh, you know, there's a political agenda there. It's a nonpartisan issue. But cannabis does need to be removed from the Controlled Substance Act. So because my sister had died with chemotherapy poisoning and we did not have access to full extract cannabis oil, I watched her misery and I watched her die. And when people started asking me, you know, we need to get this medical cannabis passed in the state of Alabama, I'm like, okay, I'm on board with this, but as soon as this legislation, by the time this legislation is sponsored and it moves through the House and the Senate, when that legislation is passed, and it was passed on May the 6th of 2021, almost 33 months ago, I did a video, I posted it, I was elated that it passed, but I let everybody know that I was going to quit fighting for anything regarding amending Senate Bill 46. I was going right back to decriminalization, I was going right back to legalization in the state, and we are focused, the Alabama Cannabis Coalition is focused on states' rights. Our motto in the state of Alabama is we dare defend our rights. And I would like for the citizens of the state of Alabama to start defending their rights. And we, we've got a really serious apathy problem here in the state. So the legislation passed and, you know, I was so excited, so elated because the implementation of Senate Bill 46, of medical cannabis, legal medical cannabis, was written into this legislation. It wasn't that the legislation passed and that Governor Kay Ivey signed it into law on May the 17th of 2021. The implementation of that legislation was written into that legislation. We're 33 months out. We still can't issue licenses or award licenses to applicants because the state of Alabama wrote into that legislation that only a certain number of applicants could be cultivators, only a certain number of applicants could be processors, only a certain number of applicants could open dispensaries, only a certain number of applicants could be integrated licenses, which is a whole nother ball game, and I think they only allowed five of those. Only a certain number of licenses could be laboratories. So free market capitalism, you know, this was passed in a Republican majority in the right. Alabama House, does not exist in the state of Alabama. So on it, August 2023, just this past summer, Chairman Stokes, who was the first chairman of the Alabama Medical Cannabis Commission, and all of this is going to come out because Judge Anderson here in the state of Alabama is going to allow those commissioners to be deposed, and there's a lot of rumors about Chairman Stokes, there's a lot of rumors about Chairman Stokes' wife, and what has gone on, those licenses have been awarded three times. They've been awarded three times. Last time was in December. Okay, now Judge Anderson, who's been handling all of these lawsuits from these applicants, has filed a temporary restraining order. So the dispensaries have a temporary restraining order on, and the integrated licenses have a temporary restraining order on. So what that means is the cultivators have their license. They can go out there and they can start cultivating. The processors can start making medical cannabis products, but there's not going to be a damn place in the state of Alabama that you're going to be able to get those products because the dispensaries have a temporary restraining order on The integrated licenses, applicants, who can also have dispensaries as part of their uh, application, their license, they're not going to be able to sell any products either because they've got a temporary restraining order on them. Until these applicants, until this is addressed and this is resolved, medical cannabis in the state of Alabama is dead. There is, and uh, the Alabama Cannabis Coalition called for a special session in September of 2023 when all of this was going on. 
I contacted the governor's office and said we're asking that this legislation that you call a special session of the Alabama legislative body to Montgomery and amend this legislation so that this legislation, these act, the licenses can be issued. Mike Ball, that sponsored the legislation as an Alabama House rep, uh, was interviewed by the same media outlet that I was interviewed with, and he laughed and said, oh, we don't need to go that far. It'll all get worked out. Just wait and see. It'll all get worked out. Well, Mike Ball, it hasn't gotten worked out, and it's not going to be worked out until this legislation is amended. So, and I'm going to, you know, keep your, hold your hands and questions that you might have, and I'll be glad to answer any of all of that. But that's kind of where we are with medical cannabis in the state of Alabama. Almost 33 months later, the sick, the suffering, and the dying citizens in the state of Alabama that were hanging their hats on this legislation, hoping that they would have legal access, still did not have access. Think about the people that have PTSD, veterans, 22 a day, commit suicide, and they were hoping for this legislation. So in my opinion, I pray to God that they have access to the black market, and my personal opinion is let the black market reign in the state of Alabama. Because I will never, ever, I will never purchase cannabis products in a state-run organization, and that's what this is. You know, and, and people think I'm crazy because, you know, I've sort of, sort of black market for the past 48 years. Well, what else would I have had but the black market? And I am a consumer. Now, last year when we were in Auburn, we had an, another cannabis advocate, advocate in the state. She's also a lobbyist that was you know, doing her presentation or whatever. And one of her boots, now she's a business owner, okay? So she has an end game. She has a monetary goal in every word that comes out of her mouth. But I don't have an end game. Now, I'm not financially invested in this. I'm fighting for freedom and liberty for the citizen state of Alabama. But one of the things that she said when I first met her that really, really troubled me and it really, really bothered me, because I believe in free will. I believe each and every one of us have a decision to make in our lives. And when we make those decisions, we're responsible to do the due diligence to decide, is that going to be a decision? Because there's consequences to decisions. Is that going to be a decision that I'm going to, in the end consequence, is going to be something I'm going to be satisfied with? And she said she's totally against any type of cannabis products being sold in gas stations. Okay? And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, okay, number one, I don't want anybody telling me where I can buy my product or what kind of product I can buy, and nobody has ever died of cannabis. There's no record of anybody ever dying of cannabis. But their position was people need to be educated about these products. We can't let people just go in gas stations and buy these products. They need to be educated. It's not my responsibility to make sure that somebody is educated. It's the due diligence of that person's personal freedom to determine, you know, to educate themselves. So I'm, I'm totally, I, I even came up with a theory the other day. Uh, why don't dispensaries, because we have legal hemp products here, and if you've never tried THCA, which is under the Farm Bill, the Federal Farm Bill, it'll get you just as high as any kind of cannabis sativa THC. And I only know that by experience from a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I started thinking about theory. Okay, you got gas stations over here. You can go in there and get your beer when you get off from work, you know. You can go in there and get your milk. But you can't get your weed in there. You can't get your bourbon in there. So I started thinking to myself, why don't these dispensaries start selling gasoline? <laughs> People can go and get their gas. They can even have a refrigerator in there. People can get their milk and their beer. And I know you're going to have to get more state lights and this or that. But I thought, what the hell is the difference in somebody going in a gas station and buying their THC vapes or buying their CBD gummies than going in a dispensary? I mean, every, I'm sure every customer that goes in a dispensary doesn't ask a million different questions. 
So that was just something that I wanted to clear up. It's my personal opinion. I think that the citizens have the right to do their own due diligence and to be educated. I mean, can you imagine going in a liquor store and saying, oh, well, you know, we've got to educate you before you can take this bottle of bourbon out of here. Or if you get a 12-pack now and you're planning on drinking all 12 of those, we need to educate you on what's going to happen if you get in your car and drive. I mean, come on, people. And, and I am a Christian, and I believe that God gives us free will, and I'm ready for the government to give me my free will back. Amen. 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 And educating people of that is a whole, whole other thing. But we talked about free markets, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm just about finished, and I'll take your questions if you have any about anything cannabis related in the state of Alabama or at the federal government, even though our uh, focus is here in the state. Last year, on April the 20th of 2023, we held our fourth annual Lobby Day in Montgomery. 25 people showed up. We had 9,000 people on Facebook, in that Facebook group, and 25 people showed up. Don't think I'm ungrateful. Those people made an effort to be there, and I am very, very grateful that they did. But we still had people complaining about the state not doing, you know, the legislators not doing what they wanted to do. I'm like, where were you on April the 20th? But on April the 19th, and I don't believe this was an accident, because everybody knew we were getting ready to have our lobby day, Nathaniel Ledbetter, who's the leader of the Alabama House, held a press conference and wanted the people of the state of Alabama to know that there would be no cannabis legislation that would be enter to entertained on the floor of the Alabama House for the next four years. Okay? So I sent him a couple of emails, called him. Do you think that he had the testicles to call me and talk to me about that? No. So I told everybody in the state of Alabama that's in the Alabama Cannabis Coalition that are members. You need to contact Nathaniel Ledbetter and let him know we're going for decriminalization because I really, truly am not a big fan of decrim. I, you know, I'm ready for this insanity to be over with. But the number of people that are being jailed and that are being incarcerated and their families are being destroyed and their lives are being destroyed and their property is being taken away from them is something that we really, really need. But anyway, so he decided, you know, he's king of the hill over there, Mr. Tyranny. Nathaniel Ledbetter, House Rep, don't, look, don't forget his name. Any other legislation comes up, keep your eyes on him. You know, he's, you know, wanting everybody to think that he's this good guy, you know. And this is his first term as the leader of the Alabama House. So, and there was something else that I was going to say about that. I'm completely drawn a blind, going to draw a blind on it. Sorry about that. But anyway, I, I do want everybody to know this Tuesday, February 6th, it's the opening of the 2024 legislative session in Alabama. They work, is it 30 days, Jimmy Blake, top list, 30 working days? It ends up being stretched out to about three months. You can go to the Alabama legislative website and you can look at every piece of legislation that's being sponsored, that's being considered to go to committee. And it has to go through committee before it can ever make it to the floor of the Senate or ever make it to the floor of the House. And a lot of people don't understand what a legislative session is. They don't understand how legislation has to be sponsored. They don't understand once that legislation is sponsored, how it moves to committee and how it moves to the House. And if you understand all of that, you have my applause because not very many people know very much about civics. So February the 6th is going to be the first day of the legislative session and the Alabama Cannabis Coalition, me specifically, is going to be making a huge announcement. Uh, I don't want to, I kind of talked to Tom about it and thought about announcing it here, but I, I'm going to wait because I, I don't want it to get out, but just stay tuned for that. And uh, I just want to thank Sam Bowler. I want to thank the party, the Libertarian Party. They've been very, very supportive of the Alabama Cannabis Coalition. They've given us a platform to speak. They've given us a platform, you know, for Lobby Day, to co-host Lobby Day. I uh, became a Libertarian because of Frank Dillman. I, I wish Frank Dillman Sr. was here. Uh, Frank is the one that got me involved and interested in the Libertarian Party. Uh, and, I, and I was a, you know, socially 
conservative Republican up until that point. And I've got a lot of flack from some people here in the party because I also founded uh, the Alabama Republicans Against Marijuana Prohibition back in 2017 because I felt like that there were other conservatives like me out there that smoked weed, used cannabis products, that were in the proverbial closet. And even though it's a nonpartisan issue, I wanted to get those people out of that closet they were in. I wanted them to see that there, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to tremble in fear that the law enforcement officers are going to come to your house and knock your door down and come in and take your property and your weed. So, um, I mean, we got about 3,500 members, but then when the medical cannabis really started getting going, I realized that the Alabama Ramp Group was not going to go any further because people didn't want to join an organization that had something that was associated with the Republican Party. And three years ago, I started the Alabama Cannabis Co Coalition, and it grew like wildfire. So uh, I do thank the Libertarian Party for everything that they've done for us. I'm very, very grateful. And uh, Patrick showed up last year at Lobby Day, and he spoke, and he was a dynamite. And then he got interviewed by CBS 42, and I was just standing back like a proud mom watching that thinking. <laughs> You know, he was just talking about freedom and liberty, and Maddie Beer Temple interviewed him, and Patrick, thank you, you did an excellent job. But uh, I'm just proud to be a libertarian here in the state of Alabama. If anybody has any questions about cannabis, you can always uh, email me. Does, what you got, Lillian? Uh, well, I heard you mention uh, THA, uh, TCHA, uh, and uh, and the regard to him. Am I saying it correctly? Okay. THCA. just a cannabinoid it's a minor cannabinoid THC is a minor cannabinoid uh, there's probably over a hundred cannabinoids in the cannabis plant and I want everybody to know it's all one plant mm -hmm. you know you got can you got the cannabis over here and you got hemp over here and people are like what is the difference it's all one plant the government has divided it up as they divide us against each other to make us think that hemp is not, you know, hemp is not the devil's lettuce or that cannabis is the next cannabis is the devil's lettuce. It's all the same thing. Uh, as far as healing properties, there's different cannabinoids that they're discovering every day, probably, that work on different parts of the body. So it really just requires some uh, research on your part, so to speak. Uh, for me, I believe that synergistically, full extract cannabis oil is like the broad spectrum. When you have all of those cannabinoids working synergistically within the human body, uh, it brings the body back to a state of homeostasis. So where somebody might want to try something like CBG or CBGN because they have inflammation or they have sleep disorders or whatever, you know, just give me the full extract cannabis oil. I mean, it's like shooting an intruder with a shotgun. I mean, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna hit your target. I mean, if you're strong enough to hold that shotgun up. So, you know, I love full extract cannabis oil. If, any, if there's anybody in the room that's sick, suffering, or dying, or know anybody that is, you know, feel free to, you know, meet me outside or, you know, ask me, you know, what products are out there that are available because what the federal government is getting ready to do with this farm bill in 2024, I'm telling you, people need to pay attention because the Fed, there's a loophole in there and the federal government did not realize that they were giving the citizens of this nation access to a hallucinogen. And when these people that own these dispensaries started selling this THCA and they realized what they had done, now they're wanting to backtrack. That's why I'm saying legalization can be given to you and the government can take it away from you with a stroke of a pen. 
But when cannabis is removed from the Controlled Substance Act, it takes a lot more work and a lot more power to get it put back on the Controlled Substance Act. And I know what I was going to talk about. Rescheduling, you might be hearing about rescheduling. All the Health and Human Services and the DEA are talking about rescheduling cannabis because right now it's Schedule 1. And they want to move it down to Schedule 3. And everybody thinks that's legalization. That's not legalization. What that is, is it's opening the door to the pharmaceutical industry so the pharmaceutical industry can gain control of the research of cannabis and sell it to you in a prescription as a synthetic. Okay? And uh, in 19, prior to 1937, people went to their pharmacists, they went to their drugstore, and they were able to get full extract cannabis oil without a prescription. You know, you went to your doctor with the top 100 diseases or top 100 conditions or symptoms that you had, and they sent you to your local drugstore and you bought full extract cannabis oil in a little bottle. And there's plenty of photographs out there online. But they did, the pharmaceutical industry is the devil. They don't want you to have access to something. They want profit over lives. They want you sick. And every time you take a pharmaceutical drug that's synthetic and it's introduced to your body, your autoimmune system is like, oh wow, this is making me feel better. How many times have you heard somebody say they went to the doctor and they got a pharmaceutical drug and it worked really, really good for about six months and after about six months, they went back to their doctor and they're like, this is not working for me anymore. We're going to have to find something else. So they give them another pharmaceutical drug to take in its place. And not only that, the pharmaceutical drug that they're taking is causing you to have another symptom that's causing you to have to take another pharmaceutical drug. And Dr. Blake, I hope I'm not stepping on your toes there. I'm just telling you what my experience has been and what my research has taught me. Profit over lives. So rescheduling versus uh, descheduling, you know, we don't need rescheduling. We need it descheduled. We need it to be removed from the Controlled Substance Act. So, and I'm open to any questions that anybody might have. Yes, Patrick. Thank you. You're welcome. I was going to ask, you, you mentioned that you're a lobbyist, and so I was going to ask if the Alabama Campus Coalition has bills or specific legislation that they court legislators with. <laughs> it's funny that you mentioned that because Dr. Blake asked me about that outside. Those legislators really won't talk to me. I mean, I go down there and talk to them, but they, they don't want to entertain me. And I've been down to the Alabama Medical Cannabis Commission meetings just in the past, probably October, November, and December and uh, walk up to those commissioners that I have not had an opportunity to meet and introduce myself and hand them my card and their response is, oh, we know who you are. So, yeah, so I, I really don't know if it's my approach is so transparent, you know, but I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm here for truth. You know, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm, I'm, I use my decorum. I'm very polite to people. I'm not abrupt with people. I have respect and admiration for what they're doing. Uh, the job that they have has got to be a difficult one, I would assume. Uh, to me, it doesn't seem so difficult, but apparently it is for them. But uh, no, we don't have any legislation that's being, I, I get up every morning and look at that website and there's no legislation out there that's been sponsored to even amend Senate Bill 46. So there's no telling where that's gonna go. But great follow -up. question. I had a follow-up is, does the ACC have a pact no, 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 we're not even a non-profit. Okay. Anybody else? Well, thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity today. I hope that I've said something that's going to inspire you, even if it's not in the cannabis movement, to get involved with freedom and liberty. It's our essential role as humans on the planet, you know, to protect our freedoms, to protect the freedoms of our families, and to protect the freedoms of our communities. So Sam. <laughs> and I do want to give a special thank you to Anson Knowles because he made it possible for me to be here for the next two days. And thank you very much, Anson. I appreciate it. Have a great weekend. Getting it 
uh, into the hands of the, the people. It's almost as if they pass the law because the prevailing winds are making it that way across the country. But they were like, no, we, we still don't want it, so we'll just bury it with endless bureaucracy. 